Hey everybody, so I wanna walk you through a mistake that I made on the fuel tank. Luckily, nothing's been pro-sealed yet. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I've done some final drilling, but I haven't done any countersinking yet. I'm gonna show it to you in a second, but first, I'm gonna show this to you on the plans. Um, I'll bring a picture of the plans actually up on the screen, but when you look at page 18-4, there's no mention when it says to attach, what is it? Um, T1002, which is the back baffle, and I'll show it to you on the screen there. There's no mention of a side, of one side or the other side. You just put it in. Now, obviously, the little channels go up, but there's no preferential treatment, um, and there's no mention of it in the plans. But then if you come over here to page 18-5, if you look very closely, and I'll zoom in, there's an extra hole in the skin in the middle at the row that attaches to the baffle on one side. It's on the bottom of the skin and not on the other. So now, if we come over here, and if we look in here, see there's one, two, three holes right next to each other there. If we look on this side on the outside of the skin, we just have our normal spacing, but there's not that extra hole right there. So this is the top of the skin with the fuel tank or with the fuel cap. But when we come around to this side, It looks different. You have one, two, three. So you have the, the normal holes plus that additional hole. Now, this is where the two holes in the baffle, those extra holes are. So this piece is turned 180 degrees. If you noticed, there was the hole here, but that's because I drilled it. Now here's the problem. The way I found out the baffle was in wrong was I clecoed everything, right? Clecoed every other hole, both sides. And then I did not cleco any of these three holes because if I clecoed them, the drill bit wouldn't fit, the drill gun wouldn't fit there. So I clecoed these two holes and left these three open. Then, by coincidence, when I started final drilling, I started on this side here. So I final drilled every other hole. So there's probably 80 holes on this side. So I final drilled about 40 holes on that side. Then I looped around here and I started final drilling every other hole. And then I drilled that hole and it went in perfect. And then I went to drill that hole and I hit metal. Because when you're final drilling, you just go and it just goes right in. But I went that one like, and it wouldn't go in because I actually use one of these special drill bits when I final drill, if I could find it quickly, it looks like this. So this drill bit doesn't even have a tip on it. It has a very shallow taper and then it's designed just for that final drilling for making the hole bigger. So then at that point I was like, man, I've already final drilled them. Oh, and by the way, I final drilled all of these before that. So I had final drilled like 75% of the holes before I hit that. And then I was like, uh-oh. So I pulled out my calipers and I started measuring and everything was symmetrical. I'm like, maybe it doesn't matter. Everything's symmetrical. But I called Vans today and the guy at Vans was like, you know, that's interesting. I've never noticed that before. And so again, we pulled up the plans and I showed him the dimple pattern. And he's like, you're right, there's an extra hole there. And he looked at the instructions, there's no mention of orientation because every other hole lined up perfectly. No mention of orientation. So he's like, let me look at the design plans or whatever, the engineering plans. I guess they have a much more detailed set of plans. He pulls it up and he studies it for a minute and he looks at it and he sees the extra hole. And then he notices that the bend angle on these angles here, I don't remember exactly what it was, but one was like 81.1 degrees and one was like 81.6 degrees. So literally the bend angle on these two is half a degree different, half a degree. Um, so we think it's worth it to flip it around I must have gotten lucky. When I did this one, this is this is the one I did. I must have just gotten lucky. I must have just put it in correctly, clecoed everything, and it worked fine. 
I actually final drilled this one first and had no problem. So, you know, it was 50-50 chance. I got lucky because I didn't even notice it. So here's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to stop the video. I'm going to pull out all these Clecos. I'm going to pull out all the Clecos on the Zs, and I'm going to rotate this 180 degrees. So this side is now on this side, how it's supposed to be. And then I'm hoping that all the holes line up. Our theory when talking to the engineered vans, and this theory makes sense, is that if they lined up this way and it's wrong, they should line up the correct way when it's right. Um, the good news is I haven't machine countersunk these holes yet. So once I, I have a feeling that even if they're off by a hair, when I machine countersink them, I might have to final drill them again and then machine countersink them. I think had I machine countersunk them already, we would have had a problem. But I'm going to stop the camera. I'm going to pull all these Clecos out. I'm going to flip it around and I'm going to re -clico it and we'll see where we're at on that. Great news. The holes lined up perfectly. I'm gonna run the final drill through them one more time to make sure, but every Clico went in just silky smooth. A couple Clicos maybe had a little binding. I'm just gonna run the number 40 and the number 30 through them just super quick, but we're not off. We're not gonna be expanding any holes or anything. I mean, we're talking about, you know, millimeters, less than millimeters, thousands, and then they're gonna be machine countersunk, but it lined up perfect, so. Um, you can see how easy that mistake is to make. I hope that this helps you not make that mistake. I've gone ahead, I've marked. So that's the hole that I drilled that isn't supposed to be there. And now the three hole punch. I don't know if I'm filming this correctly, but the three holes, the one, two, three that came pre-punched now line up with the skin. So just when you're putting your tanks together, um, pay attention to that. Pay, pay very close attention to that. It's an easy mistake to make. So hope that's helpful. Okay, quick video for myself. So here's the right tank. Here's the top of the right tank. For the ribs inside, I did them starting at the partial rib on the right. We did A, then B, C, D, E, F, G at the top, H, I, J, K, L. So they start in order from A down to L. Then I did R1 and R2, R1 and R2. And then as far as the ribs, I did starting at the solid rib. The solid rib goes, so this is the top of the, of the, of the tank, this it's the side with the cap. Well, I didn't even need to do that because it's a solid rib, but it's the top right one, top right two, top right three, four, five, six, seven, etc. Now the left tank only has, their left tank I labeled a little differently, um, but I just basically did L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, L6, L7, L8, L9, 10, 11, 12, and then I did 13, 14 over here. So the bot, yeah. And then the way that I started lettering or numbering these, same thing from the solid rib. We marked it to the top so we orientate it properly. And then this is left one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, that should take care of all the labeling. All right, I wanted to do a little update on the fuel tank where getting close to the pro seal. So first thing is I drew this little map. Well, basically, let me back up a little bit. I've got two workstations. This one's still a little messy, but I basically divided up my tanks. I've got my left workstation and I've got my right workstation and I have all my parts lined up. Um, but basically I'm about to, this is making me nervous. I'm about to do this whole assembly here now. I don't know if I'm on the correct side yet. I'll double check the plans, but for the fuel 
for the airflow, the fuel pickup line, and then I'm adding the um, uh, fuel return. It's roughly approximately correct. I'll have to get all the parts in first. But basically, again, just wanted to give you kind of a quick update of where I'm at. Uh, so we've countersunk the top of the fuel. I've got this little map with all of my stiffeners. So they all line up because I'm going to eventually clean the tank really well. And I'm going to lose all my markings there. I've got all my ribs deburred and... Um, sanded smooth you definitely want to sand you want to sand the mating or not sand but scotch bright the mating surfaces and you know all your deburr marks and everything before you dimple so i'm going to be dimpling those probably tomorrow dimpling i'll be doing all the dimpling tomorrow i just want to get everything ready for dimpling so i can just have one big dimpling session um but i wanted to talk about this quickly I'll bring up the plans or I'll take a quick picture of them here. This is uh, page 18.5, steps one through five with figure one. Boy, this was confusing. I mean, it looks simple, but the instructions are getting slimmer. There's less speaking points. I didn't build the empennage, so some of the stuff, some of the more details are missing for me. So I just had to take a little extra time, but just take your time here, pay attention. There's different nut plates, there's different um, rivets. It doesn't talk about what gets dimpled and what gets machine countersunk. So what I ended up doing, you know, I talked about dimpling. So I dimpled, I dimpled the doubler, and then obviously I had to machine countersink this to get it in there and then you've got these two that are dimpled all the way through to the nut plate uh, these other ones are not and again sticking with the theme i am not priming but i am priming where the stainless steel nut plates attach to aluminum um I understand that they're aluminum rivets and the whole thing, and I know it's not perfect, but it's it's the best we're gonna do here. So just kind of spot priming different parts. But yeah, just wanted to do this quick update, show you where we're at. The last thing I wanna show you here, the lighting may not be as good, but etched up, you know, scotch brighted, uh, the inside of the tanks. So again, I'm, I've done one quick cleaning. I'll do another detailed cleaning before I dimple that, but I used, I'm gonna use the method that's in the Vans video so he does not use tape to protect from the pro seal because his method for applying pro seal is so clean but i did use tape for scuffing just because i wanted those clean scuff lines i think it looks great so that's it both skins are ready and next time you see me i might be pro sealing so i know that some of you are going to have more workspace you know i've got a three car garage but my wife still parks in there, and then I've got the wings and the tail cone and bikes and bikes and just life. So, you know, I'm really limited to kind of a one-car workspace. So I just wanted to share this with you. This is an incredible design that, again, the gentleman who built the plane or started building the plane before I bought it from him built. I've seen plans for these, um, but basically, you know, I keep the... DRDT2 kind of under the workbench. It weighs so much and it's actually nice. It keeps the workbench more stable. But when I need to do big dimpling projects like I'm about to do for the fuel tank skins, just having this like kind of mobile setup. I know some people have built like little tables that go for the DRDT2 between the two tables. And I was going to do that, but then he gave me these and this is just awesome. So these things are totally... You know, they weigh nothing. You can kind of get a look at the construction. Super simple. They fit right into here with little notches. Perfectly level with the dies. And I have plenty of workspace on both sides. And then I'm just clamping it down in the back. All the force is forward. And just wanted to share that as I'm about to dimple the skin. So if you're 
a little tighter on space and you don't have like a permanent setup where you have your DRDT2 mounted and a big work table and you need things that are flexible and mobile, this might, this might be a great little setup for you. Alright, so you might have seen in a priming video I did, I went ahead and just, um, I think you saw me machine countersinking these and, and fitting them and doing all that, but then I just scuffed them and did some self-etching primer because of the nut plates are steel and you can get what's called, I think it's galvanized or galvanic, galvanic, um, Corrosion. So I just put a little bit of primer on those because I'm not priming the plane. Watch that video. I'll link it. But what I wanted to do was just show you this really cool kind of process that I'm doing here. So first thing I do is uh, I put my little punch through because I don't want to scratch these. So that way that gets the Clico aligned in one hole. And then I align it in the other hole. And that way it doesn't get scratched as I'm like sliding around once the Clico's on it. So put it through the first hole. And then I'm gonna show you something else pretty cool here in a second. So we'll do that, make sure it's in. Let's get one more. Get a Clico. And now we're good. Okay, so now, we're gonna make sure, perfect. That one doesn't fit and I wanna show you what I'm gonna do and that one is pretty good and this one is perfect. So, I always slightly under countersink. This bit, I think I got this at Cleveland Tool. It's a 100 degree single hole reamer. It was like $24 but it fits into my little palm screwdriver. I use this for deburring. This is my primary deburring. Now I have one of those swivel tools, uh, but I like this more because I could just do that. Plus, like this hole is probably one one thousandth. I don't know under countersunk, so I'm just gonna hit it. Boom, that'll be perfect. This hole, well here, let's try it. Oh yeah, it's perfect now. This hole was a little more under, so boom. And now that's gonna, yep, that's just perfect. And then this awesome pneumatics. So I'll show a picture of it, but um, it's got a foot pedal. So that way this thing's not as heavy as the squeezer. And then I'll just. Squeeze these rivets. And then we'll repeat the process, but now those are just flush as can be. We'll repeat the process 11 more times. Well, then the other hole, so 23 more times. Hope you enjoyed that. So this is by far the easiest technique to remove this blue protective plastic. Again, assuming you're able to, like on a flat skin or a flat sheet like this. Um, but absolutely the easiest method out there. Let's just say that today's riveting session went much better. I did have a little 
VFR, while I'm showing you this, I'll tell you about it. I had a little VFR into IMC incident last night. I might have some video that I'll show right here over this, but really quick, just it's serious stuff. Be careful with it. I was flying home at night. Weather was clear in route. Weather was clear where we took off. Weather was clear where we're going. 10 miles, no clouds. Some fog must have rolled in because we were about 20 minutes from our home airport and I started getting stuck in some clouds or fog or something and I kept descending and descending uh, until I was about 2,500 feet and there were some towers in the way and I didn't really want to go any lower. I was on VFR flight following and it was fine, but it's the first time I'd really been in clouds. I'm training for my instrument, but it's all simulated. And um, it's a good thing I was doing my training. You just kind of, as you're descending down, I just stayed on my instruments. There was one point where I was getting a little nervous and looking around the cockpit at different stuff and looking at my headings and everything. And I kind of lost my artificial horizon and I was in a 20 degree turn and didn't even know it. So when the foggles are on, you know it, you can see out the side, you know it. But when you're in the clouds, you didn't know it. And again, just boom, right back on that artificial horizon. And uh, we got through safe, no problem. We got, once we got through all the towers, I got down to about 2,500 feet and then we had a clear landing in visual landing. But um, it definitely wakes you up. And any VFR pilots out there, man, even if you're not gonna get your instrument, do some instrument training more than you have to on your private. Shoot some approaches, do some instrument training, fly under the, the foggles, get into the real clouds with your instructors if you can. I mean, I am so glad I was training for instrument right now because I think that kept me calm and got me through. Probably not what could have been a fatal incident. It could have been, but just got me to pay a little bit more attention to what's going on. Well, it's a beautiful, beautiful sunny morning. It was pouring rain yesterday. I got to play golf in the rain, but that's fine. I don't get to play golf too much anymore because I'm building an airplane. So I wanna give you an update on fuel tanks. The last video you saw was all of the mistakes I made and all the challenges I had with the fuel tanks. But now that I've gotten um, most of the right tank done, I wanna kinda of share with you what I've discovered and maybe some things that will help you. Again, this is not a how-to video. Watch the Vans fuel tank video for that. I'll put the link up there. It's just amazing. I don't know how anyone built a fuel tank before that video because the instructions that Vans provides are slim to none for this step. But basically just a couple of things. Um, one, Jason Ellis, I'm calling you out here. You've been a great help. I've talked to you a couple of times, but this stuff isn't that bad. Now, maybe that's because I've just been overly prepared by everyone telling me how bad it is. And yes, it smells a little bad. It's not terrible. It's incredibly sticky, but I've got it on my work shirt and that's about it. And I'm wearing the same work shirt as I work, but it's not terrible. Don't be afraid of this stuff. Jason, I love you, man. But um, here's what I've found. I've used this kind of mix your own stuff like they do in the Vans video for all of the parts up to you know, the baffle part. The baffle, I'm gonna use the tube, the more like a silicone, silicone caulking gun because you gotta run beads here. With this stuff, what I found, here's what I do. Oh, and I wanted to let you know, I don't know if one container will get you through two tanks, but I can tell you I've barely put a dent in this one. So I think one container will get you through two tanks and then you'll need two of the silicone, the tubes, one for each baffle because once you mix that whether you have leftover or not it's going to cure unless you're ready to go with both baffles then i don't know maybe you'll get one but i ordered two of these because the other stuff i had that the previous builder used for like trailing edges and things was expired i ordered two i do not think you will need two but i will update you when i'm done with my two tanks but basically here's what i've done i love this clean sheet Nothing gets through these pieces of paper. I think there's a hundred pieces of paper on here that just peel off. Always mix in this corner or this corner where it's got two corners. I made the mistake once I mixed here and it started peeling up, but I love this because I could just pick it up and I can hold it and I can mix on it and I can rest it up here when I'm doing all my fillets. So I love this. Problem I have is it's very hard to measure on this. So I have two scales. I had my normal kitchen scale, which is accurate to a thousand grams, but it's only accurate 
one gram at a time, and that wasn't working when I needed to get the accelerator. So I measure out my, my big, the white stuff on here. I just put this on top. And then thanks to Gil, Gil Barros or Barros, Gil recommended the drug dealer scale. You can get these at amazon.com slash I'm a drug dealer. Um, but no, I'm kidding. Just Amazon. It was $9.99 delivered in one day. And I cut out these little pieces of paper. I put it right here. This is accurate to 0 0.001 gram. So that works great. So I put the white stuff on here, put this away, mix up my accelerator. So if I'm doing a 30 gram batch, which 30 grams is more than enough per rib. Uh, I like doing 30. I haven't gone down to 25 just because I like having the leftover, but I do 30 grams. That gives me enough to scrape it onto the rib, put the rib in, create my fillets if I need on both sides, encapsulate each rivet like they show you in the video and then I still have some left over if I need and I just don't feel the pressure of oh my god I'm gonna run out so I do 30 grams per rib and then three grams of accelerator I mix about 3.1 grams of accelerator because some accelerator stays behind on the paper when I scrape it off into here but this system has been working perfectly um, I keep a bowl with some MEK in it and I put a little cardboard top on top because I noticed the MEK evaporates fast. Obviously work gloves. I've got about 20 to 25 Clicos that I clean after each session, but these are I'm using these same Clicos over and over and over again. And even though they clean up pretty well, uh, I'll probably just set these Clicos aside into a different container and maybe not use them as much. Here's my little encapsulator tool. I just made about four inches of aluminum tubing, put a flare on the end of it. And then as they show you in the video, I have found I don't need the rounded, the curved bucking bar. I have a curved bucking bar um, somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, I tried it. I didn't like it. This, which most of us have this tungsten bucking bar. If you do not have this tungsten bucking bar, you need to spend $100 and get one. I know it sounds like a lot of money, but let me tell you, this tungsten bucking bar is a lifesaver. But I use this for every rivet inside unless I'm back riveting. Um, I've found, uh, in the Vans video, he uses the, the version without the rubber on it. I still like the rubber and I do use packing tape. I know he uses, uh, masking tape. What I do, a little trick that I do though, to get the packing tape off easier, I take one drop of oil and I rub the oil on the face of this and then just around the edge of the rubber. So when I put the packing tape on, it sticks further down here. After, you know, 30 rivets, it kind of breaks down the oil and still sticks, but I find that I'm able to get this off and clean it much easier than if I just stick the packing tape straight on there. Again, just one drop, you put too much, it'll slide all over. My wife thinks this is hilarious that I have a collection of mixing sticks, but um, what I do is I use these little thin, cheapy ones to get the white stuff out. And then I go into the accelerator the black stuff with a clean, heavy duty stick. That's how I measure that. And then I mix with this. The white stick, or the one that I use for the, for the paste, I just throw out and then I mix with this stick and then this stick just gets set aside and becomes kind of my scraping if I need to get more stuff into a pile. This stick I keep reusing because it's perfect. Um, again, according to his directions, I created, can I get it to focus here? I created a smaller fillet with just some sandpaper, uh, a smaller radius, and this is for creating the fillets on each of the edges on that side. And that one's not very clean. Let me show you one that's better. And on this side here, so I scraped that up. And these little pieces of paper for folding up like that as per his instructions. And then you go into each rivet before you put, oops, like that, before you put a rivet in to get rid of some of the excess, that works great. I'm trying to think what else. I mean, that's what's been working well for me. Again, I've got my stand clamped. So again, as per the video, when I'm doing, I just pick it up and turn it around and do the other side. And then I pick it up, turn it around. Again, something else that I changed. He does not have you Clico in all the ribs, uh, Scott, before you start. I did. I clecoed in all my ribs. I got the whole tank kind of reassembled. 
and then I'm pulling one out at a time as I'm working on it. So I'm gonna do these two ribs right now. So I'm gonna pull this one out and then um, slide it back in and work on it. I just find that it keeps the shape better and it keeps it a little easier for me. I have a piece of wood, I forgot to grab it. Where is it? It might be under the work table. I have a spacer. Oh, here it is. Oh, if I can get it, sorry. I just cut some notches in here and then I use this. This is about a half inch to an inch bigger than the opening, as you can see. And so when I pull that rib out, I'll slip this on between two dimple holes and it'll open up the skin for me so I could drop the rib in without scraping all that glue. And then, um, yeah, I think that's about it. Maybe my last tip, and most of you already know this, is I like to rivet hard. Um, I'm learning that if I put the rivet gun on like 65 and really hit hard, I get really smooth rivets. When my rivet gun, sometimes the dial on there slips back to like 57, 58, and I can feel a difference, then I find that I don't get quite as flush of a rivet. So I've been riveting at about 65 PSI. And same thing when I was back riveting these guys. Uh, the first couple I did, I wasn't really pushing hard enough. And the rivets were good, but they weren't great. So push, push hard. Oh, there is one more tip. When I get to the top, these last couple of rivets here, like this one especially, right here on both sides, I grab a clamp and I clamp this closed. I grab one of my vice clamps and I clamp it closed because at that point I've done every rivet except for this last rivet. And just because of the angle, I find that there's a gap there. It wants to open up and even just pushing with the rivet gun doesn't seal that gap. So I, um, I see clamp or I use one of those you know, big vice clamps, I clamp this closed like that, and then I rivet that last rivet, and that keeps everything hugged in nice and tight. So a lot of tips here that I gave you. Um, we'll see what happens when I leak test here. But again, Jason, love you, man. Sorry, just didn't want to call you out in a bad way. I think you're awesome. Your videos are amazing. Your honesty has been great. You've inspired me. Uh, and Gil, thank you. And everyone, I really want to reach out to everyone in the vans, uh, RV 10 Facebook group. I've posted a bunch of stuff in there and some of them probably seem like dumb questions, but you guys have been awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm not, but I did this. I did the toilet paper test. So in typical Ryan Grom from fashion, I checked and I checked and I checked and I forgot to put a cap on the fuel pickup line. So when we got to that level with water, that started pouring out, that sucked. And then everybody says these fuel caps leak. Uh, you can't see underneath here. It's just the standard gray, like polymer fuel cap, but that leaked. So I had to try to get some duct tape on it while it was wet and that's not holding. So you can see a couple of drips coming out, but other than this is wet because the water was pouring out of the fuel caps, but I've dried it off and checked. And so um, nothing is leaking other than the fact that I forgot to close off the fuel pickup line and the gas cap. So I was planning on leaving this overnight, but since the, the fuel cap is leaking, um, I'm going to go ahead and drain this now. It's been in here for about 15 minutes and we're not getting any leaks other than that. So I'm gonna call this test a success and we'll seal up the baffle and then we'll do the pressure test. Okay, so later today, we're sealing up the back of the tank. I've been literally sitting with the tank for a month because I'm so nervous about sealing it up, but I've cleaned the inside, I've checked everything. I put the baffle on, the baffle's right there. I put the baffle on last night I just made sure that everything was drilled out properly and rivets all still aligned because after adding pro seal and re-riveting the ribs, I just want to make sure nothing shifted. I did have to final drill a couple more holes. The rivets were just a little tight, but I'm ready to go. I've got my, um, my pro seal tubes. 
which I'm gonna use. I've got the caulking gun, which I'm gonna use to caulk a bead around there. I've got some Pro Seal from the tanks the in the big tubs that I'm gonna use um, to like dip rivets in and things. This is more of a backup if I run out of that because I wanna make sure I have that for the clean beads that I want. And then if I need to mix up a quick batch of this, got my trusty drug dealer scale. Um, everything is ready to go. I've got my squeezer with the uh, dimpled uh, for the AN470s. I've tested it. It's calibrated. It's ready to go. I've got my squeezer for squeezing. I've got my rivets, my 3.5s, my 470 D4-4s, and then these special rivets. These are the uh, AD41s that are designed to not um, leave a hole in the middle so fuel doesn't get out. And um, I'm not going to get into the details of how I'm doing it or film a video of actually doing it because the Vans video is nearly flawless. But just wanted to document kind of getting ready for the process and hopefully the next video you see will be a successful job on the baffle. All right, so I'm nervous. Um, We've got our bead, we've got the corners plugged in pretty good. We're about to put the baffle on, so I just wanted to get this quick video. Thanks, John, for helping. Yeah. Neighbor John. Well, the deed is done. This is the left tank, and it has been sealed. The baffle um, underneath, so not much to show here. Um, I'm gonna pressure test it in a couple of days. And then assuming that goes well, I'll give you guys some tips on what I learned, but how arrogant of it, or how arrogant of me would it be to give you guys tips about what I did and how I did it if it has a leak. So right now it's just resting upside down. Hopefully gravity will push all that pro seal, say a little prayer for me, into the corners and into the wedges. And uh, we'll see. Well, I know this balloon doesn't look like it's inflated, but um, there's definitely pressure in the tank. I filled this balloon up, put it on here. These balloons just take a lot of pressure to fill up. Uh, I'm going to get another balloon and double check the test. But again, I'm certain there's air in there because I've checked it like three times. Um, and I also know there's air in there because I found a leak. And it's coming at that joint right there. And that is so disappointing to me because the rest of the tank is completely leak free. No rivets leaking, not even the slightest bubbles, not even bubbles around. The valve, the, um, or the filler cap, all on the outside, all on the inside. This was the joint I was worried about because the way that the Vans video did it has you put a bead on the inside of here. And I just, man, I just felt like I wanted to smear a lot there. And I think on the next tank, I'm, I mean, not a lot, but just do a thin smear. Plus the way these Z brackets, when he had you not do it on the inside, but do it on the Z bracket made me really nervous. But um, man, I've, I've, I'm gonna spray one more time just to make sure, but everything looks good. Like I said, I'm gonna spray one more time, but the only little leak I've got <sighs> is up here. So I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some research, but it looks like the vacuum method um, of maybe drilling out two or three of these rivets, putting some, um, some pro seal in there and creating a little bit of a vacuum to kind of open this up and, and bring it down. Um, oh, I was gonna say, wouldn't it be nice if that was on the top of the tank? Um, not that you wanna leak anywhere, but being on the bottom of the tank and being right at the fuel pickup, so the lowest spot of the tank. This is exactly where you don't wanna leak, but this is about as, I think, as good of a place as, as there could be if you needed to fix a leak for sure. So, there you go. All right, let me turn this off here and we're gonna give this, actually I'm gonna leave it on for a second, but 
I've got my little shark vacuum to their mini tube. This is an air rocket launch tube that fit perfectly over one of, or my fuel return or fuel, one of the valves there, whatever. This is just airtight blocking it off. That's the nipple. And then I've got this open. And if you listen carefully, you could hear it's sucking. Listen. So if I cover it and then let go, you could hear, you could even see the metal maybe in the shadows a little bit. I don't know if you can see that, but when I put my finger over it, it creates a vacuum. So I took some of these metal shims. This is all because I had a leak. The leak was right here. So I drilled out three rivets, took some of these metal shims. Let me turn this off now. I took those metal shims and I opened it up here. And then I tried to shove as much Pro Seal down in there as possible. And then I put the vacuum on and when I held my finger over it, you could see it would suck a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of Pro Seal in and then I'd shove more in and suck it in and shove more in and suck it in. And now I just went about another six, eight inches and I'm creating a fillet here. And I'm just gonna smooth all this out, create a nice fillet, put a vacuum on it one more time, two or three times here. I'm gonna use my finger and then we're gonna let this cure for a few days and hopefully, I mean, it was such a small leak. Hopefully this does it. If not, I'll have to, um, I'll have to do a baffle right here and get in there and really do it properly. So it looks like my repair work. Those are just bubbles from spraying, but there's nothing forming. And I know a lot of you are going to say, well, you fixed it from the outside. No, I didn't. I had the vacuum on and I think I showed that in the video previous to this. I had the vacuum and sucked the pro seal in. But then just for good measure, I see I did put a bead on the outside there. But that's where we had the leak. Oh, my neighbor's doing some yard work. But the loom's been holding for about two minutes now. I'm going to leave it on there for a little while longer. But I double-checked. I sprayed the whole thing. No leaks anywhere. I know this video is already super long. So I'm just going to quickly give you some tips here while I'm just showing some footage in the background for the FAA so they can see that I actually did the work that I'm talking about on this airplane. But the first tank, uh, other than that tiny little leak at the corner of the baffle was perfect, had no leaks anywhere else. I showed you how I repaired that. Watch the Vans video on building fuel tanks. It's perfect. I did everything they said and everything worked out perfect. The only thing I would change is how I pro-sealed in the rear baffle. Everything I did was perfect and everything Scott shows you in that Vans video is perfect where you run that bead and then as you set the baffle in, it pushes down. The only thing I did on the second tank that I didn't do on the first tank is I spread a thin layer of Pro Seal on the edges of the baffle in addition to the thick bead that you lay in the tank and then push the baffle on top of. And I think the Pro Seal loves to stick to itself. And I think by having that thin layer of Pro Seal on the baffle that when you push in, I just think it worked a little better. And like I said, the second tank was absolutely perfect with no problems at all. Good luck.